68 and 69, the Organizable Coalition and some of the other tremendous things that we were doing. But the thing that, you know, people may lose sight of is that we were 17, 16, 17, 18, 19 year olds, you know, not steeped in any uh, tradition of organizational structure and discipline, but we had a, a, rudiment, a rudimentary knowledge of that. And we were fortunate enough to have charismatic, visionary people at the top. But basically, uh, within the Illinois chapter, uh, the Central Committee made the decisions and the rank and file carried it out. I think that um, structurally, I just want to kind of backtrack one second before I talk about gender, is that um, the Lords in New York at least, I know, because of our work with the Panthers, uh, we structured ourselves the same way. And for those of you who don't understand that, it's a paramilitary organization with ministries. And each ministry has different people of different ranks of the line. And at the top of each ministry is a central committee member. So you could have an information ministry or what are some of the other culture. ones? Culture ministry, education, Real defense, um, health. Whatever the issues were, um, and then you had the defense ministry, which was responsible for looking after the welfare of the community. Those are the peace officers, and um, and also the organization, because the organizations were under attack. The Panther Party more so than the Lords, but we had our own issues as well. So structurally. Um, the, the ideology that I think we tagged on to afterwards because I agree, we were very young and the Panthers were older than we were in the Lords because I was older than, I think I was older than everybody in the Central Committee um, and, and I was like 21. Um, we had our youngest Lord, full Lord, was all he was 12. Um, and Fee was 15 on the Central Committee. So, I mean, imagine, uh, most of you in this room are older than we were, and, and we were trying to make a revolution in about five years, <laughs> you know? And um, that was our five-year plan. At the end of five years, we were going to take people's power. And we believed it. That's the other thing you have to understand. So we had to come up with a structure that worked. You're talking about taking, with also on top of that, a, a lump and proletarian ideology, which meant that we were bringing in lots of folks from the street who may have been shooting dope, who may have been in a game, who may have done whatever, who did not like to take orders, and they had to follow orders. So they had to be disciplined too because you have people coming from, we also had students who can be very undisciplined as well. And so you had to have that in some kind of structure um, and you had to have consequences if you didn't do what you had to do. And, um, and you had to learn to, leadership had to respect cadre on certain levels because they could be called on the carpet too. Uh, I, my job was officer of the day in the Lords, and I could give out discipline to anybody, and I did. I gave out discipline to central committee members. You were late to the office, run around the block 20 times, give me 100 push-ups, and then the other things that, if you violated things more fragrant, flagrantly, I'm not going to go into at this point. <laughs> but, yes, gender. Um, <laughs> Restate the gender question? Okay. With the um, growth of female leaders, and clearly about women, I, mean, I think in my research I try to show that um, the Black Panther Party has been unjustly kind of accused of being an overly misogynist organization. Uh, and I, I would argue that's part of, part of the many myths about the Black Panther Party that um, deny its historical significance. So we have folks here to speak to that. So with the growth of female membership in both organizations, 
What do you mean by growth? Because we had female membership in the we had female membership from the beginning in New York. It, they increased, I would argue that as the organization extended, more women came in the party. Right, but I'm saying in New York, it started with as many women. No, but I want to correct you. Okay, I'm a young lawyer, but it was not the case. Okay. 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 <laughs> and, I, and I also want to say that this, this is a very difficult question because what? One, when you talk about it, when you mentioned it earlier, Catherine, the Black Panther Party existed for 16 years. All right? So what the Panthers were not in what I call the genesis of his revolutionary stage when they had pantherettes and panthers. It's far different. It's far different they didn't have that one comment. It's far different. I'm not where I was ever. I'm trying to even I'm trying to see They have been open at one time. Okay. So they did. <laughs> <laughs> As you see, this is a controversial issue. So you have the Panthers, what the Panthers were in the performative year, different than it was in decline, different than its high. Also, within the Panthers, you had at one time 42 different affiliates. Right. Right? So what happened in Chicago did not necessarily happen in Los Angeles, did not necessarily happen in Des Moines, Iowa, which that chapter was founded by. Which did not necessarily happen in Boston, which was led by a woman in Audrey, you know, Audrey Jones, which is different from um, in Kansas City. So, with, with understanding that, okay, what I'm trying to ascertain with women in the organization, whether it was a growth or not, okay, how did that impact everyday life? How did sexism manifest in the organization? And how did the organization respond to sexism? All right. In your particular program. I will tell you that very point blank, I instituted a policy that socialism stops at my bed. <laughs> <laughs> and I slept with a nine millimeter under my pillow. <laughs> and used to inform my comrade brothers that no, <laughs> because we lived collectively and it was about no. Right. And they understood that, okay? Because there were issues about, um, unfortunately there was this influence from cultural nationalists who, um, who believed that our beautiful Ebony sisters are just supposed to hang around and have babies. And um, and Panther sisters nor Lord sisters were about that. We didn't want to hear it. That doesn't mean that Panther sisters didn't have children, but the Panthers I knew in New York, I knew a lot of women in the Panther Party. I was out there with them on a daily basis, and there were a lot of women in the Lords from the beginning. Now, was the Central Committee all male? Yes was the central sort of leadership in New York City initially in the Panthers male? Yes. Okay. Who did almost all of the work? <laughs> um, a lot of sisters. And um, later there were contradictions, but we, and I've talked with I went with Panther Sisters and Lord Sisters. We went to meet with Fran Beal when she founded the Third World Women's Alliance. And we point blank told Fran, the solution to what's going on in our community is not for women to walk off and leave our brothers behind, but we have to educate each other and work together. We refused to splinter our organization. We were attacked by, what was her name, Robin Moore? Uh, wrote that article in the Rack talking about rat, free Robin Kathleen Robin Cleaver, Morgan. Robin Morgan, free Kathleen Cleaver, free Iris Luciano, free this and that and the other, and we told her where she could take that <coughs> because our community is made up of women, is made up of men. Yes, we have issues, and we have to educate and struggle, and we did struggle. We had the platform change. It used to say machismo must be revolutionary and not oppressive. That's an oxymoron. <laughs> and so we changed that. And we struggled 
And I'll tell you, at the point in time when we addressed that issue, it wasn't just sisters who addressed it. There were brothers in the organization that agreed with it too. Not all of them, but they had to, you have to weigh internal ideological struggle as well. We have a responsibility to each other to move along. Yes, there is machismo. Yes, there's sexism. Um, but there was certainly a lot more representation of women in a level of leadership. There were women in the Panther Party that died. There were women in the Lords and the Panthers that went to jail. Um, and, um, and people in day-to-day -day struggle. And we were also kids, you know, with hormones. <laughs> Um, and we had to learn how to control those things too. What do we know about being responsible adults? And these are the kinds of issues that I think we don't always personalize. We think of the movement or posters and all that other stuff, but I think that we were human beings attempting to make change in our communities, in communities that were not talking about these kinds of issues at that time. And we had to define them in terms of our own unique African American and Puerto Rican experiences, and it was very different from the uh, white women's left at that point. It wasn't about burning bras. It was about food on the table and jobs in our community and get the police off our back, first and foremost. I'd just like to add one thing. which is moved in the, in the other room, and uh, the Minister of Information, Pablo Guzman, also said that um, back in 1970, when it wasn't necessarily she, there was a, a gay caucus within the Young Lords um, that many other organizations have done. So we were dealing with the entire issue of sexism, not just about relationship between men and women, but also about the gays. I want to uh, give a uh, kind of a male point of view on this, on this issue of <coughs> Uh, females in the party, and and I, 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 I can think of two two incidents, and myself the transformation and and and, and those of us who came out of the black community came out of a masculine community uh, uh, culture. Those of us who came out of the black church, where the preacher was always the man, and the women did the work in the church, just like today. So. <laughs> We came into the party with similar expectations. Myself, I never had taken orders from any women other than my mother and my grandmother. So to come into a, an organization and have women my own age telling me what to do was a bit of a struggle. <laughs> it, 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 it was hard to accept. And one thing that, 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 that caused me to transform is that I was part of that cadre that stuck up dope houses for the party. And, <laughs> What, what we actually believed, and, and at the time, Dick Gregory used to have a joke that, that every eight or nine year old child in the community can point out where the dope house is, but how come the police can't? <laughs> so we actually believed that the police were allowing that to happen in the community, and subsequently we found out that the police in Detroit would raid a dope house on the east side, take the dope, and then go sell it at their own dope house on the west side. And, they, and some of them were busted for that, but anyway, I remember. Uh, uh, we had stuck up one dope house, and at least we had, were at the door, and the people started shooting at us through the door, and the splinters and the bullets came, and we we're all ducking and dodging. So it's really a hairy type situation. And I remember being in one of these situations, and I was with a brother, and he was shaking like Don Knox. He was just trembling so bad. <laughs> <laughs> and I was with this sister, and she was just as cool. And, and, and I saw then it wasn't about genitalia, you know? <laughs> if, 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 if your life is on the line, you don't care whether the person, you know, is a man or woman. You want somebody who's got some heart, who's cool and calm in this dangerous situation. Now, subsequently, this very same woman who was in this uh, operation brought up the leader of the party in Detroit on charges of what was called uh, and Mao is a selfish departmentalism. <laughs> what he was doing is he was, the women who looked the most attractive, he would bring them to his office and give them light duty in the winter time. They didn't have to go out and sell papers. If they were giving sexual favors. The women who didn't, and he who didn't look so attractive, he would send them out in the snow 
and to other offices. His sisters busted him for this, this particular sister, and, and, and understand how the party worked, we had what was called criticism and self-criticism in the collective. We would sit around in a group, and to maintain our unity, anybody who had anything that caused them to be disunified from any other party member had to bring it out. We put it out on the table. What's your beat? And through criticism and self-criticism, the, the formula we used was unity, criticism, unity. We begin with unity, and then something happens to disturb that unity, so there's criticism, then at the end we resolve it, and then there's unity. The sister bring this brother up on charges for selfish departmentalism, for uh, what, what now would be called uh, sexual harassment. And he was warned by the collective uh, that he should just stop this. He states in front of the collective body that he's not going to do this anymore. A month later, he's charged again. He's doing it again. <coughs> and myself, having was, I was in one of the leadership positions. He called on me for my support. My support against the sister who had been in this operation with me. <laughs> no, 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 no. She had my back before, and I had her back then. All right, brother. And we, we, we. Now, we put him out the party, and he, he was allowed to come back in four months, but he was not allowed to come back in a leadership position. He was never again allowed to be in a position where he could order women around and, 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 and misuse his position like that. Now, that was, for me, a great transformation. It was a painful transformation to accept women in that kind of way, but that, those were the kind of transformations that we were going through at that time. As she said, we, you know, I started off, I was 17, 18, 19. I want to say something else. Uh, Charles had asked about this with leadership. Uh, uh, I can give you an example. And one of the things about leadership, as Kathleen said, it was a great deal of pressure. And having been in that position, I, I always used to say that the, the key to leadership is knowing what to do next. Because the party, being in the Panther Party, was a series of crises, uh, local crises in your chapter. Uh, and we have to always keep in mind that the uh, FBI had declared us the number one internal threat to the security of the United States. Absolutely. I remember when I heard that, I looked around at these people, wait a minute, you guys? <laughs> you know, like 18 years old, you? <laughs> us? I could, you know. But they acted like it. And I remember uh, I was in charge of this breakfast program, and it was in the basement of a Catholic church on the west side of Detroit. And we started off and we, it was so good, we were flipping pancakes and, you know, frying up bacon and stuff for the kids. And we had a whole bunch of kids. They started coming, like 30, then 40. Then all of a sudden it went down to six. Then it went down to three. And I asked one of the little girls where everybody went. And she said, the nuns had told their parents that we were putting dope in the food. Now, the question is, what do you do next? Now, subsequently, if anybody can go online right now and look up COINTELPRO, and you'll see how in the FBI documents they say, we must stop this breakfast program. Mm -hmm. They were more against these kind of programs for the community than they were against us having guns. So, I, I, in the criticism and self-criticism session, it comes out that, obviously, we had just put out flyers and, and stuff and advertised our free breakfast program. We hadn't gone around the community and actually talked to the parents of these people. That was my mistake. I was criticized for that in the group. So what are we going to do? We're going to set it up in another church. But before we do it this time, we're going around knocking on doors, telling everybody, we're not putting dope in the food. We're your sons. We're your daughters. We want to help these children. Now, this one was successful. But after that, there's always a series of things. We get out, pick up our newspapers, they smell like urine. It's like somebody has peed on 10,000 papers, you know, at the airport. Look at the FBI files and COINTELPRO, you see where, where it's suggested that they use some stuff called susprofa on our papers. In the FBI, the FBI is telling each other around the country, do this uh, to make them smell so bad they can't be sold. They had suspended for us the First Amendment. We didn't have First Amendment rights. So evidently, this, this, and Susquehanna is supposed to be the worst. 
but evidently it was too much for the airport, so they, they used urine instead. So you go pick up your papers, and they all smell like urine. And I'm saying, I said, damn, these pilots are peeing a whole lot. How do they peeing on all these papers? You know? <laughs> you know? What do you do? So, so the papers are ruined. We won't accept them, but we don't have any more papers. So now, what's the decision? Well, we got the mimeograph machine. This was before Xerox. So we got the So we make our own little paper about everything that was happening in Detroit. And we put Huey's picture on it. Running off the stuff on the mimeograph machine until we can get our papers again. And we make this formal complaint. So leadership was a continuous series of crises. It's just something every day, including going to jail for, for just about nothing, you know. But that's what leadership was like in the party. And, and the issue of leadership and gender, they often work together. Uh, this issue about <clears throat> reformulating, because we were so young, we were getting our ideas as we were part of the organization of how we were going to look, what we were going to do, how we were going to be. And I think one of the things you, we're leaving out of this context is that the entire era in which the Black Panther Party was functioning and the Lords were functioning was also the era of the Vietnam War. We were looking at these posters. One of the key things, one of the most striking things you saw about Vietnamese posters are pictures of women carrying guns. Women with the little hats and the little pajamas. And the Vietnamese, this issue of Vietnamese taking on Uncle Sam and the people, this concept of the people's army and the ordinary people People like us, young people, people who didn't have a lot of money, could be a force that could take down and hold their own against the entire military might of the United States, and they were women, uh, was very powerful. So that gave us the sense that if we're women, that doesn't mean we can't be soldiers. That doesn't mean we can't be your warriors. And I think that in the Black Panther Party, Women who came into this organization from whatever perspective, whether they were straight out of college, straight out of high school, whatever, but they developed a sensibility and created this concept. And this is why it's hard for people to get it, because it does, it's not a concept that's out there. But we were urban warrior women. And that's what we saw ourselves doing, and that's how we projected ourselves, and that's something new. And so it's an unstable sense because there's no place for us. Whenever I go and give talks about the party, I get these questions. And, and, and what is the role of the women? Because what kept talking about revolution and things and people couldn't see themselves as women in it. But I would say it's the same as men. You know, we are revolutionaries. We are comrades. And I think that's, that's something that's hard to grasp. But that's why our organization was somewhat distinct in the black, uh, black liberation movement. If we really want to get a sense of uh, what the audience thinks about this discussion, and we'd like for the audience to pose questions to the panelists, uh, and we're going to do that uh, immediately, I would like to ask uh, the panelists to keep their answers as short as possible so that we can get as much um, audience participation as possible. But before we open it up to the audience, uh, Daryl is going to ask one final question. One last question. Uh, a number of you have brought up the kind of uh, coalition politics that went on between the two organizations. And so what I'd like to, uh, to hear a little bit more about is specifically the Rainbow Coalition, but a little bit more broadly, the nature of the relationship um, and coalition more broadly between the two organizations. So, but to brief. Okay. Uh, we formed the uh, I guess the first Rainbow Coalition was in Chicago, and then it spread uh, nationwide to other cities. Uh, and it was started by Fred Hampton, Chairman Fred Hampton. Uh, and, and the reason, the main reason that it was formed was uh, we understand, you know, the, a classless society, that's what we want. But sometimes uh, you have to look at, there's a process to get there. and. We understood that, for example, the, the Young Patriots was, was an Appalachian white organization, <laughs> excuse me, and so they had a lot of issues in terms of racism and that to, to, to deal with in their community. They lived in a very poor community in Chicago in Uptown, and so they, they, uh, they were having, there was difficulty in, in trying to form that coalition because of that. 
they were wearing a Confederate flag, you know, on their on their hats and their and their jerseys and that. Uh, we had the whole question of uh, self determination for, for Puerto Rico, uh, and you know, we're talking about na nationhood, and, and we're talking about even though we recognize the, the Black Panther Party is the vanguard party, but you couldn't go to that to the uh, Latino community. I mean, they're looking in terms of empowering themselves, and, and that's what we wanted to, 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 to bring about. So we, the Rainbow Coalition to us was more like uh, directed at trying to work with the national question as a stage in the development of a classless society. Uh, you know, when I went to, I was able to visit, the, I don't visit too many places, I don't travel that, that much, but I, when I did go to, to the People's Republic of China, uh, they were studying the dictatorship of the proletariat, and I had read a few books, I'm not that well uh, learned in that, but I thought that they had already studied that before the revolution. It was after the revolution that the whole Chinese society was studying the dictatorship of, uh, of the proletariat. So, you know, we had a people's movement, it was a grassroots movement, and we had to deal with, with various issues, like, like the national question. <coughs> I think the, the thing, I'm glad you brought up the Rainbow Coalition because it's one of the things that really is a bugaboo of mine, which is that most of you, when you hear the word Rainbow Coalition, you think of Jesse Jackson. And he co-opted that. And I remember, Fred Hampton was one of the most powerful speakers I, I ever heard in my life. And Fred used to say, I am a revolutionary. And I love all my people. And he would go through the colors of black people and brown people and yellow people and red people. And people would respond. And Jesse changed it to, I am somebody. There's a very big difference between I am a revolutionary and I am somebody. Okay? And so, no, I mean, I want to hear for taking the name Rainbow Coalition for the style. It's like he studied him and watered it down. And, um, and you know, let's call spades a spade. Um, but it was very important for us, and I think that um, we saw the Black Panther Party as a vanguard, but I think that the Lords had other things that they had to determine. Um, we added other points to the program to deal with the issue of Puerto Rico. We worked in conjunction with also people from in New York, Iwa Kum, Most Righteous Harmonious Fist, mm -hmm. which was an Asian organization, uh, primarily Chinese. Um, later we came in contact with people from the American Indian Movement, which was the Red. And I remember when I got a chance to meet the Brown Berets from um, California who were Chicanos. And we could do that today. And we could truly build another rainbow coalition. Yeah. We can the divisive things, you know, divide and conquer is the methodology of, of imperialism, colonialism, and now the global hegemony that runs things, and we fall for that okie doke all the time. We're so busy being divided from each other, and that is so counter-revolutionary. That's all I have. We said we were against racism, but we didn't fight racism with racism. We fighted, fought racism with solidarity, and that concept of solidarity is the fundamental ground of which you get this working relationship between white groups like Peace and Freedom Party, Young Patriots, Brown groups, Chicano groups like Brown Berets, Asian groups like the Red Guard, and other white groups. It's just a principle, underlying this, is a principle of solidarity. That is, I would, I would be remiss if uh, when we talk about the Rainbow Coalition, we talk about its components because it originated in Chicago. It was a, a local phenomena initially. And it was made up, Fred Hampton was the leader of the Illinois chapter of the Black Panther Party, but I would be remiss if I didn't invoke the name of Bill Preacherman Festerman, who 
was a leader of the Young Lords, who was a critical component. And uh, I'm sorry, of the Young Patriot Party. Excuse me. I, I, got, I, had a, I had a morning this morning that was reminiscent of 1968, doing my daily work. I was up before Kate this morning. You know, so. But, but uh, uh, Junebug Boykin, who was also a critical leader in the Young Patriot uh, Party from uptown Chicago, and also some unknown, unmentioned uh, community forces. Uh, Chuck Gary, who designed the button, which was actually a button that was left over from the Nixon Agnew campaign. There were surplus buttons that had been thrown out. And uh, the uh, uh, Uptown Community Organization saw fit to take these Nixon Agnew buttons and paint them in the colors of red for the indigenous folk, brown for those of Latino heritage, black for uh, uh, black people, us, Black Panther Party, <laughs> yellow for uh, people of Asian heritage, and white for working class hillbillies from uh, West Virginia and, 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 and other parts of, the App of Appalachia. So, I mean, there's a, there's a film, which I have a copy here. If you ever get a chance, it's called American Revolution II. And uh, uh, the, the uh, same filmmaker, Howard Alt and Mike Gray, who did uh, The Murder of Fred Hampton, were also the filmmakers of American Revolution II. We'd like to open it up for discussion. And I think what we should do is to take a couple of questions at a time. And I would like to, again, reiterate to the panelists to please keep your answers as short as possible. The woman in the back. Yes. Speak up. No mic. No, no. Um, you mentioned that you saw images of Vietnamese women and how powerful that was. And then you mentioned the global um, hegemonic forces just now. And I wanted to know if you could speak a little bit about that, about the global context of when you all were part of the Young Lords and the Black Panther Party. Like what other things happening in the world were influential to. What okay. Uh, can we take this? another question as well? You mean just get the questions just out get, there get, uh, at least two of them. <laughs> yes. Following that same line uh, about the international context, did you have any discussions about what was taking place in Bolivia, what was taking place in Uruguay, what was taking place in Algeria, and how did the, uh, the emphasis on creating a cultural environment that Gramsci talks about creating a cultural uh, renaissance or a counter hegemony? Into your, your okay. Well, as far as the global context, we were children, we were youth in the midst of a war that was going on, and the people who were fighting the liberation movement were in Africa, they were in Asia, they were in Latin America. We were part of the America, we saw ourselves as what we call the belly of the beast. And the beast was, was, was a Cuban concept, that the beast was the imperialist that was financing the enemy of all the people. And uh, Denise and I, I haven't seen her for a while, but the, one of the most important trips that we took was to the heart of Africa, to the People's Republic of the Congo. And we were invited there as members of the Black Panther Party from the international section to participate in a conference that was the support of the Anglo, uh, liberation against Portuguese colonialism because they saw us as the youth movement that was in solidarity with them and they took us around. We saw MPLA camps. Uh, we were also invited, uh, sent delegations to Korea, sent delegations to China. We worked in, in Germany. We had a, a people's uh, newsletter to help the solidarity work of the soldiers, African American and white soldiers that are opposed to the Vietnam War. So we were working in a global, or we called it then, international context. 
Yeah, and I think that, um, I mean, Daryl, you yourself have looked at every issue of Palante. Um, we attempted to, to broaden our community's understanding and always place uh, what was going on in other parts of the world in terms that people in the community can understand and relate those things. So we would have articles about the Tupamaros in Uruguay and educate the people that that was what was going on. We would talk about something going on in Mozambique and then we turn around and talk about something going on in Korea or in Vietnam and um, you had to focus on many of these, you had to deal with people's everyday ordinary problems in the community that we were organizing around. But to explain why the fact that food in your supermarket is really expensive, you then have to explain issues of import and export and exploitation of labor, but you have to do it on a level we did not walk around and talk to people in some kind of language that they couldn't understand. It was one of my biggest critiques of a lot of people on the left. They didn't know how to break things down in such a way to make... My, daddy said, my, my dad said to me, you know, if your grandmother can't understand you, you're full of shit. <laughs> and that... And he put, I, I'm, excuse me. <laughs> no, but I'm saying that was basically... We needed to be able to talk about you know, um, and not come in with the epistemological, nomothetic, emic, etic, dialogic deconstruction <laughs> of a paradigm shift. You know, like what? Um, and that's one of the problems I have with the intellectuals of today. And I work in academia, but I still can speak English. You know, <laughs> that my students can understand.
And one of the main ways we dealt with it, uh, I can say in Detroit, is through reading the teachings of a revolutionary psychiatrist named Franz Fanon. And, and, and Franz Fanon said that uh, repressed aggression was one of the main problems with, with uh, oppressed people and that uh, it engendered an inferiority complex and other psy uh, psychological problems and that they could be overcome and wiped away if you overcome that last, that taboo of struggle and that all of your energy, if it's placed in this struggle, that you would uh, wipe out your uh, psychological problems. Now, that's how we looked at it. Now, people might have been crazy in the process of that, but, but, but that's how we dealt with, uh, you know, we didn't have any psychiatrists, at least we didn't have other than France for none. And we believed that, that uh, you know, basically like, like Freud said, that mental health is being able to love and work. Well, at least we just said you can work. If you can do the work of the party, you know, and hold it together, then you're mentally healthy. Now, some people did break down under the pressure. Were beaten. I remember a young lady, she came to the office, she was beaten so bad by the police for selling Panther papers, she simply was afraid to go out in any kind of way as a Panther anymore. She was just afraid. Psychologically, she couldn't handle, handle it. So that happened. You know, people were human. We have three questions. The gentleman in the black? And here, yes. Um, I wanted to know what you guys' take on where we're at today um, is I, I teach elementary school, and I was dealing with one of my kids who was um, really, really on the streets and stuff, little kid. And I said, you know, his parents and everything in games and all that. And I was like, have you ever heard of the Panthers? He's like, nah, I've only heard of games. So, you know, I talked to him more later about that. But, you know, it's like kids today haven't even heard. You know, so what happened between then and now? I know we can have a whole conference on that, but just a quick take on that. Okay, before we answer that question, yes. I'd like to thank you for continuing to share your experience with people and being very honest about the lessons learned. My question is, can you discuss the role of cultural artists in the movement and how they were able to And the, quite, and the gentleman in front? My job is as long as the gentleman here that spoke about it. I wanted to find out if you all felt that the struggles that you experienced back then, I know we as a people, meaning minorities in general, because I deal with um, minority students in my program, um, do you feel that we've gotten lost along the way in the things that you were doing to try to lift up us as a group of people? Um, well, you know, I was listening to the young brother uh, who was the school teacher, and, and I'm a school teacher. I work with at-risk teenagers, and there was a disconnect. There was a period. It was, it was basically a manifestation of an oppressive system directing their resources to destroy an organization that represented a threat to the status quo. Uh, and, you know, our leadership was assassinated, exiled, incarcerated, and driven crazy, and any number of other things. So, I would say that that's where the gap is. What I'm doing now, and working with my students, it's what I can do in a classroom in 45 minutes, with 25 young people is to relate my experiences and what I know about the struggle to them. And, you know, I, I run into a lot of problems and I don't want to get into this too much, but, you know, the thing that I started with was the word nigga. Because they come in my classroom, nigga, 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 and I say, wait a minute. And I hold up a picture of five young black men who were lynched in Sabine County, Texas. And I said, you don't know what nigger means. That was the last word that these young brothers heard. Die, 
nigga. And they say, man, Mr. Gaddis, you didn't have to do that to us. They say, I don't want to hear nigga no more. If, if I, I, can, if I, I want to ask an answer about cultural artists. Oh, culture, right. culture? I'm not really, I'm not that good in culture. I mean, we, this button here, I helped design it, and I don't know anything about art or, or culture or anything like that. But we had, uh, if you looked again at the, uh, at the uh, pic, uh, pictures of the church, we had uh, we had artists that were involved in in uh, Puerto Rican history within inside the ch church walls, outside. Uh, we've always had artists. We had in New York, we had Pedro Pitre, uh, po po poets and that. So we've always had artists involved. You know, the whole cultural revolution in, in China was also in, in, within the Black Panther Party and the uh, and the Young Lords. But I wanted to say something. The only thing I know a little bit about is, you know, I was a senior counselor at, uh, where, where I worked at. And uh, I did, in Grand Rapids, Michigan, uh, about eight or nine years ago, set up what they call a, a, a youth program, a gang prevention program and that. And I used the same concepts as, it was called the Kale Club there, but I used the same concepts of, of the Young Lords just to kind of keep myself in practice in organizing and they kind of, they work pretty well. Uh, just being, uh, what Poison said, just being involved with the, with the Young Lords and the Black Panther Party, uh, understanding Franz Fanon and that, uh, that gets you, that is like a program in itself. That was a program in itself. I mean, these were people that were not forced into the Young Lords. These were people that, that wanted uh, to be in the Young Lords because they believed in free, you know, free Puerto Rico. Uh, so these, these are, uh, that was the, our relationship was, you know, we couldn't, uh, even to take over the church, this came from the rank and file. These were people that wanted to, to uh, they believed, it, it was a people's revolution, you know. The dictatorship of the proletariat, it was a people's movement in every barrio, every neighborhood, uh, every ghetto in the United States. You know, people were getting involved and active. And, and that made, so that was changing the whole ghetto. That, that was changing the whole body. That still works today now. Time, conditions, and place deal with everything. That's what Chairman Mao said, right? And we kind of read, read a little, the little red book once in a while. But uh, so, you know, today people are involved. Uh, uh, only about three, uh, two years ago, I had a, uh, it was called Lincoln Park Camp. You know, when they were talking about Al-Qaeda and all that, we had a Lincoln Park Camp uh, near Grand Rapids, Michigan, and we had it for four years. So we were camping out because we were upset with, with Mayor Daly, you know. Uh, so uh, we had about 125 uh, young lords come to the, to the camp. So, you know, we're definitely still involved. We're still active. I'm, I'm, I'm not dead. I, we're not dead. We're still alive. You know, we're just, it's just a different process. And, and so uh, what we need to look at, if the brother that said something about uh, the new Black Panther Party now, I feel a little bad, you know, because the young lords, and New York call themselves the Young Lords Party, but but you know what? That's what I wanted. Uh, that that's what we wanted was to increase the movement. You know, we were we're not worried about unity, not disunity. So we definitely have some issues to deal with. Uh, and sh but you know, uh, people need to respect the old leadership also. You know, so I mean that it, we have to look at that. But we you know, uh, Chairman Mao, if I can go back to that little red book again, said that. Uh, Friends and enemies. In, in any battle, you know, you have to pick, decide who are your friends and who are your enemies. And if you look at today, uh, uh, the movement hasn't been doing too much. Now, today, there was a uh, demonstration in Washington. And so, you know, the anti-war movement is, is coming back. And see, we need to find out as many people as we can unite with as we can, because there's the Patriot Act out there that's worse than COIN and TELPRO. So we need to, to, I wanted to quit a long time ago. Uh, except when the repression came down on I me, mean, I said, you know what, I think it's better, let's just stay with the movement. And so uh, that's the way we need to look at it. We need to try to unite with as many people as possible, respect the, the old leadership, and, and continue to struggle. I, if I, I can tell you that we had about eight or nine different central committees in Chicago, and I went, went it down because a lot of times people wanted to quit. They, they were burned out. And so I had to tell them, you know, we're going to give you a, a, this position, this title, but we got to keep going, you know? And, and that's what we need to do. We need to keep going with the struggle. I wanted to answer about cultural artists. Um, 
because I think that's very, very key. And I think both organizations were able to show that you cannot look at a palante or a panther paper without seeing art, um, even revolutionary cartoons. There were always poems. Some of, there's beautiful poetry expressed. Um, <clears throat> we engaged in street theater in, in many ways. Um, and um, I think one of the interesting things that happened with the Lords was the big concert, the Lords in New York, at the Apollo Theater. Uh, for the first time, a Puerto Rican organization used the Apollo Theater to invite and have African American, Puerto Rican, white performers on stage together. The white group was the Young Radicals. They called us up and said they wanted to be a part. Uh, they did grooving on a Sunday <laughs> afternoon. <laughs> and we had Eddie Palmieri. We had, I mean, it was, we had the last poets. Remember, we, one of our, our initial chairmen, Felipe Luciano, came out of the last poets. And that was Felipe, Galen King, and um, David and Abiel Um So it was part of who we were to express and to figure out a way to organize people around using multiple forms. Pedro Pietri was not a young lord, he was the poet laureate of the young lords. And, um, and, and those of you who have never read Puerto Rican obituary, I suggest that you do. Okay, we're going to take Mickey and then we're going to take one more question and wrap it up. Yeah, speak, speaking of Pedro, to try to keep some, some culture uh, alive, I have two very short poems from him. Um, Abuela in Spanish is grandmother, and this one poem is about his grandmother named Tata. My abuela Tata is 80 years old. She has been in this department store called America for 25 years. She does not speak a word of English. That is intelligence. <laughs> this, other, this other one, this other, I mean, the, the greatest thing about Pedro Petri was that, you know, you laughed at what he said, and then after you finished laughing, you understood the profoundness of it. Um, this is Telephone Booth 905 and a half, and he has a whole book of telephone booths because every time in New York City that he tried to make a phone call, he couldn't make a phone call, he would stop and write a poem. <laughs> Woke up this morning feeling excellent, picked up my telephone, dialed the number of my equal opportunity employer to inform him that I will not be in today. Are you feeling sick? The boss asked me. No, sir, I replied. I am feeling too good to report to work today. If I feel sick tomorrow, I will be in early. <laughs>
And whenever I look at uh, college students or other young people who are developing any kind of a movement toward um, sort of like revolutionary type things, my heart just uh, uh, just uh, expands. And so I was somewhat encouraged about the uh, new black campus, and I noticed that there is not this kind of uh, joint uh, uh, appreciation or effort, but I'm asking if you would, my question is, if you have a message to give this new uh, Black Panther organization, other than changing the name, from your experience, what can you tell them that would make them their work balance? You understand my question? Okay, concluding, question, right? concluding comments, uh, go ahead, your question, and then we're going to take concluding comments from all panelists. My question is kind of similar to his. Um, Y'all went through a whole lot of really heavy political repression, like state repression, and what advice do you have for people who are going through similar repression today? I think one thing we got real clear on is that our movements were based in the concept of people's power, so we were dependent on mobilizing and organizing masses of people, educating people, gaining their support, gaining their respect. And so this idea of have we lost our way and what's going on and why is no one hearing about us, we're in a period in which the notion of people's power has been totally stomped on, repudiated. You're living in a culture that is based on the triumph of commerce. If to make it in more ideological terms, we were in a period in which revolution was an ascendant process around the world, getting rid of imperialism, getting rid of racism. You're living in a period in which counter-revolution is trying up. That's what this new world order, globalization, uh -huh. and capital, finance, and corresponding white supremacist mm -hmm. ideas are in the ascendancy. And so what we were about doesn't fit with what they were about. So what to do is return to organizing, challenge these political prisoners and these prisoners you're talking about. When you show up on mass, when you go on television, when you have demonstrations, when you make sure that the community is upset about this particular arrest, <coughs> guess what? What happens to the prisoner changes. What happens in the classroom changes. We need to be mobilized, agitated, educated, and concerned with empowering our people and not <coughs> letting the, uh, uh, the government or the pigs of the power structure stomp on us and, uh, and destroy everything we're about. You concluding comments, Gattis. <laughs> uh, I, I would say, uh, regarding the question on the new Black Panther Party, to look at the example get with the program, and form a coalition, an organization like the Rainbow Coalition today in, in, in 2007, similar to what existed in uh, 1969. Not to be nationalistic, but to be about humanity. Cha-cha. <laughs> To, to young people today, I think one of the keys, I think, is the study. I, I actually have been to a new Black Panther Party meeting. Let me tell you what happened there. When Khalid Muhammad spoke in Washington, D.C., I'm sitting near the front, and he tells a group about this size, he says, I want you not only to go into the white people's houses, I don't want you to just kill the mother and the father. I want you to go in that bedroom and find that little white baby in the cradle. And he says, I want you to stab him in the heart. Now, that... I looked around and I said, now, who in here might be crazy enough to do that? And, you, and you're in the movement, you always have to ask yourself, is what you're going to do help the movement? Is it going to hurt the movement? I felt like I was having, whenever I was around them, I felt like I was having a COINTEL pro moment. I tried, I tried to talk to them. I said, you need to study some, some literature about movements, about struggle. Quit st uh, studying uh, uh, all this stuff about the white man being the devil. I said, this is not the ideology of the Panther Party. It's the ideology of, of the old nation of Islam, which Khalid Muhammad was put out of. I, they won't listen. They will not study. I, I believe that they're thoroughly infiltrated. And I don't trust any of them. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, uh, like Pedro, this person also uh, passed away in the same year, and he was our deputy uh, minister of information. And I think I'd just like to read um, one of his last statements before he passed. The arc of history is that every generation has to fight the liberation struggle. Every generation, it doesn't matter what the generation. Look at Chavez's.
bringing oil into the black community to support poor people in America. Yeah. And so these are, when you talk about what we need to do for, for political prisoners, yes, you have to organize in your neighborhoods. But yes, you have to apply pressure, have international pressure. You know, pointing at what's going America is going around policing the rest of the world and get ready now to go into Iran. You know, you better wake up and smell the coffee. And um, so we have to work globally to apply pressure. Mickey can tell you, the Puerto Rican political prisoners were released after years of pressure. They could still be in jail, but Lolita got out because of pressure and organizing, organizing, and there's not enough of that going on. Right. It's not about just having a dialogue in the university. you got to go door to door. Uh -huh. I think we can safely say that we stand in the shoulder of giants. Uh, Joseph Jordan will say some last